have a keynote conversation because the topic relates to science. Would you please welcome to the stage Bill Nye, the science guy. John, so good to see you. Good to see you. So that was the appropriate level of applause, wow. I think. Um, there was a really interesting story that relates to you in Intelligence Square that I want to start with. Oh, uh, yes. You, yes. You, you were, uh, you, you have been in the past a member of our audience. You've been out there, and there was one particular debate that you attended, and an, an interesting thing happened. Pick it up from there. So I was a debate about genetically modified organisms, GMOs. The resolution was genetically modified food. Is good or bad? Or no, or it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was stated as an imperative, genetically modify food. Oh, sentence. yes. Okay. So I would have been skeptical, had been skeptical of it because we have so much extra food in the world that goes to waste. And uh, when, I was, uh, when I had come of age and was doing science education on the TV, uh, there was, uh, it would to, to sequence the genome of a corn plant would take a month. Or, or so. And so I felt that you could have knock, so-called knock-on effects. You could do something to the ecosystem of a farm that you didn't mean to do, and this would then make it uh, GMOs just not necessary, and let's not do it, and let's not, you know, Prometheus, let's not mess with the unknown. But I watched the debate, and the, the key figure for me was Rob Fraley, who was the uh, head of Monsanto, Monsanto, ah! <clears throat> <laughs> and he was very compelling, and so he buttonholed me after the debate, and he invited me to St. Louis, to Monsanto, ah! in St. Louis, <laughs> and uh, I went there, uh, and I looked around, and I did more research, and I said, genetically modified foods, or genetically modified organisms are really okay. They can sequence, they, those people, can sequence uh, genes now in about five minutes. It's really amazing. So in the 20 years since I did the, sh the Science Guy show, I believe that, that's I'm justifying it. I believe the technology advanced to the point where they really can get a very good sense of what will happen to ecosystems. And they do just extensive tests. And Monsanto, Monsanto is now <laughs> bare. And uh, did you ever see, um, uh, Young Frankenstein? Yes. You know, Frau Bruca. Ah! Yeah. Uh, so uh, I decided that they're really not the great evil. And we have, when I was a kid, I came to New York City. The uh, uh, World's Fair was here. And there were, the United Nations had a total board. There were 3 billion people in the world. As of today, there are about 7.6 billion people. There are going to be 9, there are going to be 10, probably 10 billion people. And they're all going to have to eat something. And I think genetically modified crops are going to be a big part of the future. That's what I've concluded. So since we're... But it started here. And that's what... <laughs> I will not interrupt an applause line for Intelligence Squared. <laughs> I almost did. Uh, but I, I'm, it would be interesting to hear your experience on the process of changing your mind in the face of... Of, of a scientific argument being put before you. Tonight we're having, we're gonna be here scientific arguments. A lot of us are lay people in regard to science. Uh, can you share two things? One, I'll ask it in sequence, I'll say the second question, repeat the second question later, but the first one is, f f in any way was it difficult for you to let go of well, sure. conviction? Like, yeah. what's that emotional process well, like? Well, and I tell every, you don't do it immediately. It's not the so-called light bulb. You sit and think about it. And I, you know, I had the resources to go two places. I, I went to St. Louis and walked around Monsanto. Then I went to Minneapolis to the Monarch Venture. So one of the concerns about glyphosate, which you know as Roundup, is that it kills milkweed, which farmers think of as a weed, uh, but a monarch butterfly, I don't know exactly what they think, but I believe they think of it as food. And so one of the concerns was, or a huge concern, was you're killing the monarch butterflies because the glyphosate is killing the milkweed. So they had this meeting of what I would describe the corporate pigs, uh, Monsanto, ah, for and Brook, and, and it's getting the, smaller and smaller. And the hippies, <laughs> the monarch butterfly loving hippies. And they reached this, I thought, kind of cool agreement. There are now refuges of milkweed on what people call the flyways 
of monarch butterflies. It's really it's kind of cool. If if you come to a point, but it took weeks. Well, it took months. And, and if you come to, to a to point, sort point. of intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, where you're saying, "I was wrong," that means I was an idiot. Um, no, I, there's you, other reasons I think I'm an idiot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How, there's a lot of evidence. I think people who know me. The you know. process of letting go of an idea. Oh, it's, it's you don't do it in a weekend. It takes mm -hmm. quite a while. But it was the Intelligence Squared that changed my mind. So thank you. And so my other question, the second part of that question. <laughs> that's it. The other part of the question is, so for a lay audience who won't have the chance to go visit headquarters, et cetera, they're going to have an hour, hour and 15 minutes tonight. How do we listen to these arguments? How do we? How do we judge the quality of the arguments that are being made when science comes into it? What, what should we be listening for well, it's a, in general? I mean, I mean, to me, science is a discipline, and it's a habit of mind that is really takes, uh, uh, takes uh, years of messing with it to overcome. You know, we have this expression, confirmation bias, where you have a belief, you uh, see something that confirms it, and you embrace that. You see something that would, if there's a verb, disconfirm it or deny it, and you push that away. So it... In science, we do our best to be objective. Now, humans are doing it, so there's going to be humans involved, but the idea is to evaluate evidence. The modern word you use is critical, to think critically about evidence. It's a habit of mind that takes a long time. I'm a mechanical engineer, and, you know, when you, if the car doesn't stop with the, when the brakes are applied, then there's something wrong with the brakes, people. We've got to address this. You can't ignore it. And so... Um, Tonight, I'm, I am doing my best to be agnostic. I want to hear what these people have to say about nuclear power. I'll what, are you, you. what are you going to be listening for? There's a couple things that everybody wonders about. Is what are we going to do? Let's save that one. But first of all, is it safe, writ large? Is nuclear power safe? And then um, what are we going to do with nuclear waste? Is there a good place to put nuclear waste? Everybody wants to know that. Do you want it in your neighborhood or the other guy's neighborhood? And then there are extraordinary claims about how much it costs on both sides. Some mm -hmm. people say it's very inexpensive. Some people say it's very cheap. And I'd like to hear, I'm very interested in hearing what the two sides have to say about this. Can we take a little step back? You mentioned you were a mechanical engineer. Yeah, I'm a human, but also... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're an engineer who is mechanical, or you're yeah, an engineer so, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, I'll have to think <laughs> about it. Um, Let's what was be, I, I have a card that says uh, you're a scientist, engineer, comedian, author, inventor, education advocate, CEO of the Planetary Society, host of the Science Rules podcast. You starred in the Netflix show Bill Nye Saves the World, but perhaps Bill is best known for his children's science show, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Yes. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Yes. So speaking of science and habit of mind, that show was designed for people... 10 years old. Because, no, I'm not joking, because we had very compelling research that 10 years old is about as old as you can be to get the so-called lifelong passion for science. And I think it's about as old as you can be to get a lifelong passion for anything. Mm. Uh, uh, if you know somebody who's a journalist, he or she liked telling stories before they were seven, you know. Like you, you're a journalist, you probably like stories. I loved your show when I was a kid. You're joking me. <laughs> You're joking me. Um, what are you, six months older than I am? Yeah, or six months. So you're a kid. So, so um, that habit of mind, uh, the, the reason we did that 10 years old was to, dare I say it, change the world. Because I came of age as an engineer when we were creating the Ford Pinto. If you don't know this, this was a vehicle where the, if you got rear-ended, it would quite commonly catch on fire and there were some notorious things where people got killed by this thing exploding. And what made it go bad was there were documents at the Ford Motor Company where the legal department had reckoned how much it would cost to pay the lawsuits instead of move the tailpipe away from the gas tank. Yeah. And I was embarrassed as a mechanical engineer. Really? That's what you're doing? The Chevy Vega, you had to take the engine mounts loose and tip it to change the spark plug. This is under, and we abandoned teaching the metric system, and we took solar panels off the White House. All these things were happening, and I thought, man, the U.S., my beloved home country, is going to heck in a handbasket, 
and I wanted to influence the future, and I'm not joking you, and that's why I think the Science Guy show got this applause, I think. So you went from being a scientist, practicing scientists. Well, mechanical engineering, mechanical using engineering science to make to things and solve problems. To, to being on stage, to being in front yeah, of the camera. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Difficult transition, or? Well, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I started, as some of you may know, by winning, in Seattle only, the Steve Martin Lookalike Contest. <laughs> and because I was pressured by a group of friends who said, you're just like this guy, man. You're, and uh, I just re really respected what he was doing as a comedian, where you have to just, the audience has to choose when to laugh. You can't force it. So uh, you like to teach, and you've agreed. <laughs> you've agreed, um, though you, you, will, you will qualify yourself as not an expert in this, but you've studied up for it to give us a little bit of lesson that we can use in this debate about how nuclear power is generated, just basically how it works. Yeah, so, uh, sure. So I bet most people here know that we have discovered electrons, protons, and neutrons. And so there are certain elements so that are created in essentially exploding stars that contain energy, primordial energy in them that's still there today. And you've heard of them, uranium. Uh, you might have heard of neptunium, or which is... Uh, uh, only would exist for a, a brief time. Anyway, uranium decays. Some of the neutrons go flying out of it. And if you can get the neutrons to run into each other, it generates heat. And we love heat. Uh, we take the heat and we boil water or some uh, coolant and run a turbine, which turns an electric generator, a, magnet, um, a coil of wire moving through a magnetic field, and we get electricity. So it's heat. Uh, and so this is called fission, and it's a process different from what happens inside a star, that's fusion. But uh, it's big atoms falling apart, and the energy of big atoms falling apart we harness. But the same flying apart atom will uh, damage your DNA, and so this is why that's radiation poisoning, or uh, you, don't wanna, you don't want that, and that's why people are afraid of it. When people talk about nuclear waste, what is the waste? So. Right now, uh, we use a certain fraction of the uranium and then bury the, or put the rest of it someplace. And uh, there's big concern if bad guys or bad gals got hold of the right amount of uranium, nuclear material, there's another fabulous adjective, fissile, fissile material, that which could be fissioned, uh, then you could make a bomb uh, and even easier would be to make a bomb that doesn't really explode the way you might have think you might think of at Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the mushroom cloud. It's just radioactive and you blow it all over the place and then you'll have this mythic thing called radioactive fallout. And fallout is just dust that's now radioactive that now has these neutrons flying off it or gamma rays flying off the high energy electromagnetic radiation like light flying off of it that damages you and can make you sick and everybody's afraid of it. And so if the wrong guys got hold of this stuff, uh, it would be, it potentially could be really dangerous. And so our nuclear material that we use to fission in reactors is, is kind of diluted in a, solid, in a solid kind of way and we bury the leftovers, or that's the goal is to bury the leftovers. And how long does that stuff stay hot? Well, that's some, there's some debate. And use the word hot. That's, a ter that's an industry term. That's, uh, that's hot uranium there. Yeah. It's <laughs> hot stainless steel. No, it is. And uh, uh, 10,000 years. <laughs> so if you're scoring along with us, some of it is only 1,000 years. Uh, <laughs> the Roman Empire, I mean, you know, in astronomy, we just, we just round to the nearest power of 10. Um, that's 10 Roman empires. Like, wow. You know, that's potentially quite dangerous. And mm -hmm. what does it say about you as a society that you're willing to, uh, how haughty are you that you're gonna bury something that's that dangerous? However, the stuff exists in nature. You know, the, the dream of, of nuclear energy when I was growing up is you dig up the material, you mine it, you purify it or concentrate it, fission it, get the energy out, and then bury it again. Sounds mm -hmm. cool, what's not to love? but it's been fraught with all sorts of problems. You have something of a two degrees of separation from the discovery of plutonium. Well, I met the guy. Is the, that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
So at you the, met Bob Plutonium. Right? Uh, yeah, so at the California Science Teacher Association, Glenn Seaborg, who, uh, unlike many of us here, had a Nobel Prize. Anybody? Sure. Uh, and he got it for nuclear physics. He discovered or created or invented plutonium. And this is in Hanford, Washington, Washington State. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been. You may have been to Seattle. Western Washington is the evergreens and everything. But eastern Washington is like this separate prairie, uh, desertish kind of place, semi-arid place. And so that's where they were that's where they were messing around with these uh, potentially very dangerous materials. So we had, had lunch. There were eight of us around the table. And he said, uh, Bill, he was in his 80s. I'm doing my best Glenn Seaborg here. Bill, uh, they, want, they wanted me to call it plutonium. <laughs> but come on, plutonium sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> yes, Dr. C, yes, it sounds way cooler. And then he went on, he said they wanted, they wanted, they wanted the atomic symbol to be PT, plutonium, but he said he insisted that it be PU, the atomic symbol, if you look at the periodic table, atomic symbol is PU, he said, because this stuff stinks. <laughs> and he understood just how crazy dangerous it is. You know, if you have powdered plutonium and you breathe it, you're, you're gone. I mean, you're not going to live. And so uh, uh, plutonium, it turns out it's Uranium is 92 protons, plutonium is 94, and it has more energy and is m more extraordinary. More extraordinary? Is, is extraordinary. And uh, you can make the mythic plutonium weapon, which is a super powerful nuclear weapon. And the dream of, I uh, imagine people, what I'd like to hear is one of the ideas is to take uranium and breed it, that's a verb, into plutonium and then use the plutonium to make heat and energy and electricity. But plutonium is nominally dangerous, and at the, but at the Planetary Society, one of the things we've strongly advocated for, uh, you know, the, uh, there's the word isotope, which is, so the atomic number is how many protons, the isotope has extra is, uh, includes the number of neutrons. Proton protons and neutrons weigh almost exactly the same, or have the same mass. So plutonium-239 is what you use to make weapons. <laughs> plutonium-238 is what we use in spacecraft because it stays hot for decades. It stays orange hot for decades. And so with the right um, thermocouples or sort of equivalent of solar panels encasing the plutonium, you get electricity for decades. And the two Voyager spacecraft which have gone beyond the solar system, uh, or as far as anything's ever gone, rely on plutonium. They're both still working. They launched in 1977, they're still working. The Curiosity rover on Mars has plutonium-238, it's still working. So uh, that aside, that stuff's cool, but we're here to talk about nuclear power, right? Which so is a different use a, of this stuff. A term we are likely to hear tonight, what is a sievert? Oh, a sievert, uh, sievert, uh, that's 100 rem. That's what she is. Yeah. Yeah, I think we so, all knew that. Yeah, yeah so uh, since the 1940s, people have messed around with trying to decide what the biological effects of ionizing radiation, this stuff, uh, will do to you. And they came up with this thing, um, Wrenchin Equivalent Man. It wasn't W, it was M. And this is how much damage it would do to you. So a sievert now, what we all want, you know, uh, I quote, of course, Ernst Rutherford, all science is either physics or stamp collecting, <laughs> meaning all science is either physics or just keeping track of you know, other things. So, uh, so chemistry is really physics and biology is really chemistry, so biology is really physics. So it's all, yeah. So uh, Sievert is based on the fundamental units of meters, seconds, and kilograms. And so um, it's based on if you have a volume of air uh, and you ionize a, a, what would be an amp, a coulomb, or you know, an amp of electricity, then and you put that on a person, how much damage does it do? That's what a sievert is based on. And let me just put it this way. Every year we get two or three millisieverts, a thousandth of a sievert. If you were to get five sieverts, 5,000 millisieverts, 
you'd almost certainly die. Half the people in the world would die within 60 days. And this is, you know, at Chernobyl was the famous thing or infamous thing where people got a lot of sieverts and they died. And radiation poisoning is this crazy complicated thing. It breaks down your DNA, your fast producing cells like in your intestine. That's why people start vomiting. And if it gets in your lungs, the fast producing cells, it's just really weird stuff. So you don't want to, don't breathe plutonium, you know. Uh, I, I, I always love to leave things on a positive note. <laughs> but here's the thing, and it's so, very well understood. I mean, oh, I'll give them that, okay. that it, it's very well understood. Uh, and I'm sure this is gonna come up. Uh, you know, we've had three just really weird nuclear events. Uh, uh, three Mile Island, which is in Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania. It's right at the end of the runway and they, they had a leak and the evacuation plan sent people in the same opposite directions across the same bridge. That was, nothing exactly went wrong, but it's uh, undesirable. And then Chernobyl was just a mess. I mean, a dangerous, horrible mess, killing people estimate, you know, 4,000 people or something. And then now Fukushima. And so these are three, three, hang on. So these are three accidents that uh, okay, there's industrial accidents all the time. We're, since we're getting into the debate material yeah. here. Well, here's what I want to hear from these guys yeah. and gal. Is uh, those, the public, the problem is the public is aware of these things. And uh, how are we going to address that? Sorry to go on a big digression there. I want to say this to end it on a positive note. It has been a pleasure and an honor oh, and wow. a lesson. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bill Nye. Let's change the world. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks for great. that extra bit. Sorry, I didn't mean to mess That's it up. Nice. Cool. Thanks. Let's listen. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear what they have to say. Critical thinking.